we just start off with uh, you giving me your name and the year you were born and where you were born here in town. I was born here in town in 1924 and been native, been lived here all my life. The only address I ever had was Sandwich. Uh huh. And you are Mr. Howard Crowell. Howard Crowell. And that certainly is a familiar name to most people in Sandwich, and uh, we always think of the uh, the Crow Farm. So tell me about tell me about uh, where you were born and about the farm and how that all came to happen. Well, my father and my uncle in 1916 um, came to Sandwich, I guess, to buy the farm. My uncle was a forester, and my father was a graduate of University of Maine in a two-year technical course, and he wanted to get into agriculture, even though his family were been medical people. And he had wanted dirt under his feet, so they were able to buy this parcel of land, which is now Crow Farm, from my doctor, Fonts, who was trying to make an experimental farm out of it he was a retired doctor who <clears throat> wanted to uh, do something to educate people on modern agriculture. And this is in 19, well, 12, 13, 14, that's when he started. Anyway, he, he passed away and my father and uncle bought the land. And then my father went into the service and my uncle stayed home and ran the farm from 1916 to 1918, when my father came back, and they tried to run it <clears throat> as a partnership, and there just wasn't enough return for two people, and my uncle was a uh, graduate forester from Yale Forestry School, and he got a job with the state as a state forester, and my father ran the farm. And we, he, at the time, was growing vegetables, he had a couple cows, I guess, and some chickens, and he peddled produce in town to the Dan Webster Inn and two or three other uh, places like that, and what people would pick up. And he made a living, I guess, but it was pretty hard going. How big was the farm? How many well, then, was? originally it was about 35 to 40 acres, exactly, I don't know, because we added on to it since. And he um, tried to grow vegetables, and part of it was so much grass in it that he couldn't, vegetables wouldn't survive in it, so he converted part of it into an orchard. And that got him into the fruit business. And from then on, during the 20s, he struggled. And then when they put Route 6A through town, with the present 6A, it, uh, it bypassed the old Main Street, and a friend of his up there had a gas station which put him out of business, so my father bought his little biz building and moved it to 6A where our present building is and became a retail farm. And it sort of turned the things around. During the Depression, he was able to make a much better living than when he was trying to wholesale or, or distribute stuff wholesale. Uh, in in the village and send stuff to Boston and when it, by the time you get paid the freight and the commission in Boston, uh, there was nothing left. <laughs> <laughs> but he set up the retail business and that was the beginning of our modern day operation. Wow. And, and it was because of the, the tourism that people come well, down to visit the Cape Well, people, people at the, the time, I can remember um, we didn't have a long season in those days. We didn't open until the middle of June, and we closed, I guess, around Thanksgiving. But we had, there were, the Spring Hill Beach was very populated. Uh, Sandwich Downs was populated with summer people, and we depended on them, basically, for our, well, he did, for his livelihood. Uh -huh. There were townspeople that came too, but there were more summer people here in those days than there were townspeople. Oh. I think the whole town didn't have 1,200 people in it in those days. Mm -hmm. And now we get, what, 24,000? 21,000. <laughs> Quite a difference. <laughs> yeah. Now, what, what did he have on the farm during this period of time in the 
20s and 30s in the, in, in the way of uh, farm animals, chickens, and, and, uh, he had and a what little, material and what uh, products was he growing? He had a little bit of everything. Um, <clears throat> he, he started out with a team of horses as power, you know, to plow and do things like that. And then he bought a little <clears throat> two-wheel powered tractor, which did a little better job than the horses. But then in 1930, he bought a real rubber-tired tractor. And that we kept on. We held that for probably 20 years at least. But he had some cows. He had chickens. He used to raise his own chickens, had an incubator and hacked his own chickens. He grew vegetables. And we had, he had some fruit and very diversified. But as time went on, evolution took over, so to speak. And <clears throat> during World War II, uh, we couldn't get, he couldn't get help. So he converted the uh, cow barn into a hen house. And we grew raised eggs and meat birds for a few years. So we decided we were working for 10 cents an hour. And, we gave up the chickens <laughs> and just gave it up completely. We, we kept one cow for ourselves, and we raised a beef cow and we grew a few chickens for meat, but uh, we basically were out of that kind of a business. And about that time we bought a, a greenhouse, secondhand greenhouse, and put that up and we started growing cucumbers and tomatoes in it. So you and your father are now working together at this now, time? Now, uh, from 1940, in the mid-40s, um, uh, we worked together. I went to Stockbridge School of Agriculture and one year, and then during the war, that, uh, dis they discontinued those courses, and I never did go back. Um, by the time things, I get pretty well settled then. So, uh, <clears throat> But we gave up some things. We took on some things. We sort of rolled with the punches and uh, didn't waste our time doing something that wasn't worthwhile. And when did uh, you take over the farm yourself? Well, Dad died in the 70s. Uh, I was probably running it the last five years pretty much as the dominant partner. And Dad still was around, but he... Uh, got sort of handicapped and wasn't able to do very much. And then I ran it uh, up until about 10 years ago. Then my son came along and uh, got really interested. He went to Stockbridge School and at the UMass in Amherst, and uh, he became the dominant partner then. So ever since then, I've just sort of backed off, so now I'm just the gopher. I do the oddball things and uh, do some bookkeeping and uh, help him out where I can, but he and his son now are the dominant uh, producers. And do you all live on the farm? Yes. Uh, I gave my son a lot of land we had, and he built a house on it, and my house is on but we're subdivided out of the farm, so we're all within shouting distance of each other. <laughs> How many acres do you have now? On well, the now we about 50 now. Uh, we had had bigger pieces, and we sold some of it off for development. The Quaker Hill part is with part ours, and Shipman Road, and and the uh, people, the division, the subdivision of, on top of Chipman Road. Part of that was ours, but it wasn't farmable, so it became a quality development. And looking back at the 1930s, maybe into the 40s, perhaps even into the 50s, um, were there any other farmers in Sandwich at that time, and who were they? Well, there were several. Uh, right up the street from us, the Gavoni family had a dairy farm, and they milked 20, 25 cows. Uh, there was a retired uh, man, uh, Fred Tudor, who was part of where the elementary school is now, he had his estate in there, and he, the house is still there, the barns are gone, but he hired a herdsman to run 15 or 20 cows. Uh, the Roberti Dairy was 
on Tupper Road, which the town owns now and is just leased out to a tree grower, mm -hmm. uh, that was a real prosperous dairy. Uh, the Robertis milked, I don't know how many cows, 30 or 40. He had a big milk route. He had a full-time dairy, you know, uh, pasteurization and the whole, everything like that. And in East Sandwich, there were several small dairy farms. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, William Richards bought a big dairy farm in Forestdale and became Veg Jacob Farm, and he found about 300 acres of vegetables. And he was one of the biggest farms east of the Mississippi mm -hmm. uh, for just straight vegetables at the time. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of agriculture at the time, plus the cranberries, they're still the same acres of cranberries uh -huh. now as they were then. Uh -huh. But now, it seems that uh, you were one of the few farms uh, on the Cape, let alone uh, Sandwich, and I think it may be the oldest, if not the second oldest in town in the, on the Cape. Well, we, I won't say we're the oldest farm on the Cape. No, I think the Toby farm in Dennis claims to be 12 generations or something like that, which is probably true. Um, but I don't think it was continuously farmed uh, as a farm. Uh, we've been there, what, 90 odd years in the same family. We're probably the only, longest continuous family business in town. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, there's some origins I know from the history standpoint that there was a, a, a poor farm back in the 19th century mm -hmm. on your property, and I think that's part of your property today. Uh, could you tell us a little well, about that? Near as I can find out about that, the town. They called it a poor farm, or arms farm, or whatever you. It was a, the town ran a place for disposed people before the days of rest homes and like this. And uh, the building, the building where my sister lives now, uh, next to the farm, uh, was the old arms house, but it burnt down, and my uncle built this house on the old foundation, and. Uh, the, the, the farm that we use today was the so-called poor farm. In fact, the street, Chow Street, so-called now, used to be called Poor Farm Road. <laughs> and I don't know why they changed it. No one ever seems to know, but <laughs> it's one of those things that somebody thought the name didn't fit, maybe. <laughs> and it's true for years. <laughs> now, tell me about names. Uh, your name, the name of your farm is... Crow Farm, not Crow Farm. How did that happen? Well, my uncle and my father and uncle came to view the land and decided to buy it. There was quite a lot of crows flying around, so he thought that would be an appropriate name to call it. Not really, I, not thinking at the time that it was the derivative of, his, of the family name. <laughs> so this becomes confusing. People think they either call it Crow Farm or Crow Farm, and they think it came from the family name, and it actually came from the bird. <laughs> well, tell us a little about the, the Depression uh, period of time, 1930s, and uh, how that affected not only the family farm like yours, but the other townspeople here in the village area in particular. Well, the farm struggle, we set up this retail store uh, where the present building is now, and that probably held us together uh, during the Great Depression. But the town itself was desperately poor. Uh, there was bread lines at the town hall once or twice a week, and they would, there was free fruit and uh, um, perishable fruit. I can remember us, my father used to go up and donate a few hours every week to help. And they'd have crates of oranges and potatoes and these things, and the line was out the door with people. There was no, uh, no welfare, really. This was the welfare, but there was no unemployment. There was none of these things that we have today which people can sort of survive on, at least. And they just depended on, on these uh, handouts. And then there was a lot of little government workforces. There was the CWA and the WPA and CCC and the whole group of federally uh, sponsored work details that I guess Roosevelt uh, 
started up to try to get people working. And there was a lot of those little groups around. They paid a pittance, but they, they paid something. And uh, my father, I know, ran one, a CWA one, and their whole project was going around cutting down abandoned apple trees to get rid of diseases and insects. Wow. And he had four men in town who spent probably a couple of years part-time doing these kind of things. And uh, it destroyed, or it took away a lot of sources of disease and things like that, but it gave employment. Mm. And they survived on, you know, whatever WPA people got in those days. <laughs> it, was, it was cheap labor, but yeah. it put a few dollars in their pocket. Good. Now I know, uh, tell us about the, you know, the creek area of town and all those channels that are there today. Are they related to some of these workers you just talked about in terms of their efforts? I don't know. They were put the, the, these drainage ditches that they put in were to drain the, the little salt ponds all over the marsh to take care of the mosquitoes. And the ditches were built under the auspices of the mosquito control people. But I don't know whether the mosquito people did this on their own or whether they used some of this uh, other kind of help that was available. That I couldn't answer for sure. And did that, did that happen during the 1930s? Oh yeah, they, I could see, I remember as a kid seeing crews of men out there with a special built tool that they could push into the peat there on the top of the mash and, and pull out a slab of peat about eight and 10 inches wide and 18 inches long and they'd throw it on the side of the thing and they'd go up straight line until they got to them group of these little salt ponds on top of the marsh, which never drained uh, except at very high tides. And that's where the mosquitoes grew. So they went a little side ditch to those and they drained them all into the main creek and, wow. and um, that eliminated a lot of mosquitoes. And do you think they ever took that sod like they did in Ireland and then dry it out and use no, it? No, they just sat there on the top of the marsh uh -huh. and it finally just sort of blended in and a lot of the ditches sort of fell in on their own because it became a no-no after a while. They shouldn't have been done it. It was conservation people didn't like it and mm. environmental people didn't like it. Yeah. But they weren't available. Those things weren't thought of in those days. Get rid of the mosquitoes, that was the main <laughs> item. <laughs> now, there is also a state park in town called the Shawm Kroll State Park. Yeah. I believe that's associated with your family. What can you yeah. tell us about well, that? Well, that was my uncle's, named after my uncle. He was, the, like I said before, he was the state forester. And one of his jobs was surveying land. He was a certified land surveyor. And I guess they tell me a rather good one. He was very, very accurate. But anyway, he was, the state was starting to build the Nicholson State Park down in Brewster. And my, f my uncle was doing survey work down there and setting up, buying land or searching titles and all this to pick up this parcel of land where the, where the park is now. And he got hit by a train and killed going into the park. Wow. And the, he had spent so much time up here buying the land, which is now Camp Edwards, uh, from all the landowners, he did all the title searches and all this and was able to put this all together to make what was now Camp Edwards. At the time it was Sean Forrest. And so after he passed away, the state uh, honored him by putting his name on the Sean name with Sean Kroll. So that's the family heirloom that wow. will be there forever, I guess. That's a wonderful story. Uh, Talk to us about uh, World War II a little bit. I know from our discussions that you did not serve, but you wanted to serve. And tell us about that and the activity around town during World War II. Well, I didn't serve. I had some health problems at the time, which I tried to get in three times and it wouldn't take me. But uh, so I was sort of stuck at home. I didn't want to be here, but all my friends were around the world and. Uh, I tried to help out here and uh, I helped work with the USO 
and we had a little <clears throat> USO and Java Street and Sandwich. And uh, the Coast Guard station was a training station for both girls and men, boys. Um, there were two barracks buildings down there, and I used to go down there and run movies for them. And, um, because I had a friend who was doing this kind of business and we sort of donated our time and the films we could pick up. Now what's there today where the barracks used to be? Well, the, the barracks are in front of the present station and of course that's our lawn now, but the where Seafood Sam's building is now, that was one of the barracks buildings. Mm. Uh, the basis of they've added on to it and altered it one thing or another, but that was one of the original buildings and there was I don't know how many, it must have been 30 or 40 women and, and men training there. And the basin at the time was just a little water hole. Uh, I don't think it was 200 feet around, which they were the marina is now, that was dredged out since. Mm -hmm. But they had boats in there, and of course the canal was a vital link to, on the east coast to get away from the open ocean, and there were, Nothing to see 50 freighters out in the bay one night, next morning they'd be gone. They made up convoys and the canal was patrolled and it was the big close of bridges when certain vessels went through and there was traffic lights and policemen at each end and it was, uh, it was a real wartime situation. There were uh, guns over in Sagamore Beach, artillery guns to protect the canal and the old National Guard, or the First Corps Cadets, as they were called, used to camp out where uh, uh, Peter's Pond Park is now, and they had two or three uh, three-inch anti-aircraft rifles they put down where uh, Horizons Beach into Town Neck Road, and they camped for two weeks every summer and shoot at targets the planes would fly, and searchlight crews at night who would spot the targets and they shoot nights. It was a it was a real military atmosphere everywhere. Wow. Now, o about over Camp Edwards, <clears throat> your uh, uncle had surveyed that. Yeah. And there are large groups of military uh, over there, and as well as some German prisoners of war, yeah. as I heard. There was a prisoner of war camp there. They had a, off of the Wood Road, off 130, uh, there was a complete German village built to train people how to operate in Germany. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that, but yeah. it was there. And they did everything. Everything was in German. They had the, a duplicate of a small German village. Wow. And Just as they do today in terms of setting up in Afghanistan. That's right. Knowledge. They're very, they're doing that today to train people on the atmosphere and the looks of things and now, the USO building you mentioned, uh, as I understand, that was on Jarvis Street. And I think it's presently um, Beth's Tees. Right. And did you go down there and tell us what the atmosphere was there at that well, they time? Well, they, they had different items every night. Um, they had a movie night. I would go do that one. They have a, I don't know, a Friday night dance or a Saturday night dance. And for the local coast, basically Coast Guard people because the town was a Coast Guard town, and both native people in the Coast Guard and, of course, the, the uh, felt people that came to train there, and the canal was patrolled by the Coast Guard and the perimeter of the beach. They used to walk the beach all the way from Sandwich all the way down to Sandy Neck. There were suspension bridges across the Town Creek and, abroad, and across Scotton Creek. Uh, where the patrol people walked across to get all the way to Sandy Neck, and down at the down at the social activities, these are this was largely uh, some place for military people to go for to enjoy some yeah, social activities. Yeah, they just come the in it, rather than stuck down at the barracks. You know, the, the, they were so crowded down there at the Coast Guard Station, which is our really only source of um, local military people, uh, born in the. Matt and Falmouth had big USO buildings, but Sandwich was sort of left out, out in left field. Now, the whole base was in Sandwich, but uh, we never got credit for it. <laughs> like the airport today is all in Sandwich. 
the whole quadrangle and the everything is all part of the town of Sandwich. Over there at uh, Otis. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about some World War II situations. Certainly, people always remember where they were on Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, can you tell me about that? Do you have any specific recollections of either Pearl Harbor Day or D-Day? Oh. Pearl Harbor Day was, what, 1941. And... I really can't remember now just where we were. It was, uh, of course, a tragedy, and um, I suppose I should have remembered, but uh, I really don't know. I know that D-Day, I was in Boston, and um, it was a friend, another friend who didn't get in the service, and uh, he was living with his folks, uh, he went to school here, but he was, his folks lived out in Waltham then, and uh, we were together up there during that. Was there a celebration in? Uh, oh, town? the whole town went wild, naturally, because okay. it was uh, the thing they'd been looking for for, you know. For years. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you went to school here in Sandwich, I suspect. Yeah, right? I uh, did. Where was that? At the wing school, all 12, grades, there was no kindergarten in those days, and we had 12, basically 12 rooms for 12 grades. Uh, the high school did have about three separate, had a study hall, and there was a business room, and there was a, a uh, science room in the basement where they did um, chemistry one year, and then physics and other alternate year, <laughs> and the business part, and then there was a math room, and one other room where they taught languages, and that was sort of the whole extent of the high school. And the same teacher, now I had a Mrs. Mary Wing who taught biology, she taught French, she taught Latin, and did field walks for any of these subjects. But she was very diversified. She was a Renaissance uh, oh, woman. Oh, she was. He was a family, uh, town name, time, town family, and and in fact, he lived up the street from me. And she'd give me the devil for not being able to congregate my verbs, uh, saying in French. And then I was going out the door. She'd say, "How much is when you come to school tomorrow? Would you get some skunk cabbages out of the swamp? I want those for biology." <laughs> Very interesting lady. She was a nice person, but she she, she called a spade a spade. <laughs> now, I'm trying to picture what uh, the village looked like in the 30s and 40s. I know you said there were times were difficult, but did most people um, go to the village to do their shopping or or whatever else, haircuts and whatever they yeah, needed there from was, day to day? there were two, well, there were, it was the first national store in Russell's Market where the two grocery, uh, Russell's was a real meat cutting market. The, the first national store had, had meat, but it came in a box, sort of like it does today um, in a lot of stores. And then there were- Where Albert, was the first national? Uh, well, it was in the novelty block, right across from what is the church, Catholic Church was. I mean, now it's the Belfry or something. It was the that in the Pratt's Drugstore and Al uh, Fornius Barbershop.